Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, November 7, 2013, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, I really mean it. Well, I really mean it as far as the markets are concerned. I don't have a whole lot to lecture about this week, which is uh, by design because I want to have enough time to spend on the markets. We have a lot of developing situations going on. So let's go ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. I guess you guys are getting jacked up with me for me to say let's. <laughs> Oh, good stuff. Nice antifreeze color. What is that stuff they put in there to make it look like antifreeze? I wonder if some kid was trying to get it taken out. I know there's a lot of ways you can make it glow in the dark, too. All right. Uh, there's a disclaimer screen. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, throw me a bone. Um, sometimes we have more people here than we have reviews. On Amazon for my book. So if you get a chance, put a review up. Even if you agree with everyone else, um, got a new one today, and I was very excited about that. So, Eric, if you're in here, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, what do we talk about? Well, I want to talk a little bit uh, about returning to bases, which was kind of brought on by uh, one market conditions and two from a user request to analyze a stock, and that'll make more sense. In just one minute. And that's the main thing I want to talk about in the slides. Now, if there's something you want me to cover before we get to the markets, let me know, and I'll be happy to cover it uh, during the uh, slides. So think about, start thinking about that. Diet or the real stuff? Oh, I, I drink the diet. I'm um, I'm kind of watching my carbs a little bit. I want to trim up a little bit before I go out to um, to Vegas soon. So, <laughs> um, it just it, it gives me a little bit of a goal. All right, uh, a couple of announcements. I'll get through them as quickly as possible. Speaking of Vegas, um, I'll be in Vegas. Try the veal. <laughs> November 21st through 23rd. I'm speaking on the 22nd, I believe. and um, But uh, I'll be there on those uh, three days, uh, full days. On i am getting in late on the 21st, so I might not um, have too much time at the show on the 21st. But uh, 22 and 23rd, 22nd, 23rd, I plan on uh, being around, possibly out and about. Uh, maybe at some of the vendors' booths, so check with me on that. Uh, also, uh, speak at the 22nd, so come, come by and see me if you want. If you want to just grab a beer or something or a cup of coffee, depending on the time of the day, uh, let me know, and maybe we can um, we can hook up. Um, last week, I kind of tossed out the idea of doing a webinar or a seminar on stock selection, and I kind of woke up this morning thinking about that a little bit more, and that truly is the missing piece of the methodology and uh, everything else is I don't want to use the word mechanical but fairly mechanical I think the real art is in stock selection and that's why I have a, a website that I use for um, for my trading service I call it the order of the charts because I just needed an, another website and I needed a name for it but I do think there's an art to it but I do think it can be taught so it's something I'm kind of touring around with one thing I've noticed uh, in, in writing about it and thinking about it is a lot of, even though I, I believe you should focus on success and picking the best, a lot of the picking is in the culling, and a lot of it is, is getting rid of bad stocks. And getting rid of bad stocks is pretty easy to teach. And if you get rid of enough of them, all you're left with is, um, is good stocks. So anyway, y'all let me know if you want. I've got a couple, some feedback on that so far, and that's why I'm thinking about following through. On this, um, I'm thinking about if I did it, it would be uh, make some kind of deal where uh, the service would be lumped in uh, as no charge or something like that to make it really worth your while. So let me know if y'all are uh, interested in that. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, my flash drives have been uh, selling well in here. People uh, seem to like them, and which is uh, which is scary because you put your work out there and you never know how it's going to be received. So if you guys are interested in that, the flash drives or the weekly recordings of this. Um, show uh, and stock selection is really good a big part of the um, of the show as you know in the second half of the show we talk about stocks uh, my first two books are still relevant so check those out if you get a chance if you go to my website under books you'll see some other books I'd recommend that you get uh, market wizard type of books some classical technical analysis type of books old school type of books such as Schaubacher and things like that uh, for charting I use TC for 
Most of my U.S. work, I use Metastock for more in-depth analysis in my U.S. work and research, and then I also use Metastock for my uh, for foreign markets. So uh, check that out. Uh, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, you can go there, sign up, join. I've been putting more and more videos. It's kind of like uh, you put a video out, you get a lot of good feedback on it. So that kind of inspires me to put out even more videos. So check that out if you get a chance. I have a trading service. If you get a chance, also, if you look at the YouTube channel, I just did a video on a trading service. So check that out, too. And you can go here on my website. All right, enough of that. Uh, let's, um, let's get into the show here. Uh, during your weekly webinar, could you share your thoughts on GWR? Buy stop at 100. Can't make the show, but I'll buy the show. Ah, thank you, Steve. All right. Um, I started looking at this chart, and it was interesting. At first glance, I, I was, my chart was a little bit more to this side, and I found myself saying, hey, well, that looks like a pretty good pullback. In fact, I actually saw it last night when I was doing my scans. It popped up as a potential stock. But the more I looked at it, the more things that I began to see. First of all, I noticed it has a lot of wide range bars relative to the stock's price. And here's another one here you can see. Uh, these are fairly sizable bars when you consider most of the time it's trading at bars about this size. So again, look, you got, you know, these, these, this is the average range on the stock is about that big. And then look what happens. Then you get these big wide range bars over a day or several days. Okay, the more you look, the more you can find in here. And this one obviously, obviously is a little extreme in here too. And then here's another one here. So you can see it's got quite a few wide range bars. Now a wide range bar in the direction of the trend is a good thing within reason as long as it's not too extreme. So if it looks like this, and then you see a wide range bar higher. That's one of the trend qualifiers, straight from layman's guide. Gaps, laps, uh, strong closes, things like that. That's usually a good thing. But when you're getting wide range bars all over the place, it implodes right here, and then it, it, it tries to rally up, and then it implodes again. It's just kind of all over the place. It tries to break out of the base and implodes right back in. And that leads us to the fact that it's also wide and loose. Now, I didn't draw it through all of the prices. But you can see if you just kind of did a little uh, trend line through all of the prices, you can see that it's really wide and loose. Now, it's making a base, so it's okay for a stock to bounce around at a base. But in general, you have to really wonder if the personality of the stock has truly changed. In other words, sometimes you get a stock that bounces around a lot and then begins to trend. So as long as this is good, you're okay. You can kind of forget about it bouncing around, especially if it's bouncing around within some sort. Of range, but the fact that it has all these wide range bars throughout this range, okay, and the fact that it's kind of all over the place, that's a little bit uh, concerning. Oops. Now let's take a look at a couple other things in here. Now it pulled back to, it did break out. Oh my, I know what's going on. Hang on, sorry about that. My pen came off. Here we go. Now it did break out of its base, and that's a good thing. But unfortunately, it pulled all the way back to its base. Now, you have another one of these wide-range bars, and that looks like a TKO. TKO is great if you have an uptrend that looks like this, and then you have that TKO move, okay? But this is a move that's just getting started here, and now it's retraced 100% of it. We're going to take a little bit more in-depth look at, at that in just a few seconds. The other thing that kind of jumps out at me is the HV is really low on this stock, okay? Now, this looks like a massive move from here to here, but that's only a little bit more than about a 5% move in a stock. If we trade stocks in our portfolio that, that move around 5% in one um, in an hour. So it's this, this stock with an HV of 18, and we'll take a look at the overall market in just one second. I forget where the HV of the market is now. It's, it's actually gone up recently. But it's not that much more volatile than the overall market. So in general, I would prefer to trade a stock that's a little bit more volatile on a relative basis than the overall market. The other thing I'm wondering is, is it priced for perfection? Now, if you look at this chart here, you're wondering, well, what do I mean by that? I also get a lot of emails on that, too. If you have a stock that's more efficient in the sense of the volatility 
is lower. It's a somewhat bigger cap stock. In this case, it's not really that big of a cap stock, but it's not a small cap stock. Um, it's a railroad. It's it's a stock where they're not necessarily splitting the atom or anything. So you could have these quantifiable fundamentals. If you go back to some webinars that I did a while back, I did a webinar on efficiency, and I talk about all the things that make a stock more efficient than uh, other stocks. For instance, if you got a, a little solar stock or something, uh, some kind of alternate energy, then that particular stock has the potential to make these massive moves and massive trends and double and triple over a period of time. Whereas a railroad or a more established company, maybe like a consumer non-durables company or something that's uh, it's some sort of business where you can quantify how many widgets they make and what they sell the widgets for. And you can take a look at the competition and all. Not that you could trade off of fundamentals, but the more quantifiable fundamentals the stock has, the more the stock will tend to be an efficient one because it, you do have some sort of gauge as to what the stock is worth within reason, okay? And, and you still, I, I'm not saying go out and trade off fundamentals. I'm just saying that a stock's going to be more efficient and less likely to trend. Now, this stock obviously has been in a pretty good trend, but it's been in a trend for a long, long, long time, albeit a, a choppy trend. So, up around 100 bucks a share when it was uh, down about 30 bucks a share several years ago, plus the fact that it's a railroad. And all of those things I just said earlier about efficiency, one has to wonder if it's priced for perfection, meaning that if some bad news comes along, will the stock implode? Okay. And so just getting back to the technicals, even though at first glance it looks pretty good because you look like you got a TKO and a base breakout, but the fact that it comes all the way back to the breakout and the fact that the personality of the stock has has changed, but not tremendously, one has to wonder is it still going to trade in a wide, loose manner, combined with the fact that the volatility is lower, I would pass on this one. But again, admittedly, at first glance, it looks like a pretty good stock. Now, one thing I didn't do was look at other railroads, and that's the, next, that's the other thing I forgot to mention. If you are trading a stock or you're, con you're contemplating a stock and you really like it, then make sure you look at every other liquid stock within the sector every other stock that's possible that could be a possible trade to make sure there's not something that looks even better within that uh, sector as i often say a good looking stock can often in a in a particular sector could often look, lead to a great looking stock so think about what's going on here this stock did break out to new highs and did pull back well maybe some other stock within the railroads is doing something very similar and might be worth a look. Okay, now let's take a look at what a base breakout, a return to a base breakout looks like uh, from a figure standpoint, from an illustrative standpoint. And then let's look at two major markets that just did just that. So again, you have some sort of base where it bounces around, and then all of a sudden the stock begins to take out, take off. The good thing is there's a disequilibrium. I'm hoping that's the right word when a stock begins to break out of a base. So that's a good thing because a base gets perceived as a value zone. Anybody who bought in this base says, oh, it's, it's cheap down here, it's kind of expensive down here, up here, cheap, expensive, cheap, expensive, and so on and so forth. But in general, as long as it's trading in this range, it's right about where it should be trading. But when it begins to take off, there's a disequilibrium in that stock. And that's a good thing when you have a base breakout. Unfortunately, if it returns right back to the base, then it becomes an all bets are off type of deal. Breakouts more often than not are prone to failure. Um, a lot of people have picked apart the turtles. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not one that would, I don't think that I'm qualified to, uh, not qualified, but I don't think it's, uh, you know, who am I to judge, I guess is what I'm trying to say, their success, at least their early success. But the, the argument is that the markets were breaking out more back then and following through. And they were. It's like in 1999. Uh, you, the trend followers were just, um, they look like geniuses. Warren Buffett lost half of its fund during that period. 
and the trend followers who just threw caution to the wind and traded these crazy stocks without any fundamentals, which I think we should all do. I'm, I'm being facetious when I say throw caution to the wind. Uh, I don't think you should ever bother with fundamentals. Whereas uh, the, those stocks went up hundreds and hundreds of percent and trended nicely. So the sun doesn't shine in the same dog's butt every day, I guess is the uh, saying in the South. And the sun was shining on the turtles when they did what they did. Now, that's a long-winded way of saying that breakouts admittedly did. Um, I will agree with some of the critics that said that breakouts worked a lot better then. But you got to make money, you do have to be at the right place at the right time. But you also have to have the smarts to recognize that you are the right place at the right time. Um, I'm sure there's some great opportunity quotes in here. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is breakouts – at least in more recent years, are prone to failure. Maybe because everybody's got a computer on their desk now, and a little light goes off when a stock breaks out. Okay, so uh, if you want to trade and be very inaccurate in your trading, then breakouts is the way to go. Eventually, if you do it right, you will be able to catch something that breaks out and keeps on going. But 85.5% of the rest of the time, it's going to come right back in. Now, let's take a look at what happened in the EFA shares recently. And I put today's data in. This is um, as of a few minutes ago. And looking at the EFA shares, we see they did break out recently, and that was a good thing. And it just looks like it was off to the races. Then they began to pull back, chop around a little bit, and they pulled all the way back to that base breakout. They tried to rally, especially yesterday, but now they've given that up again. Now, the EFA shares is, um, is Europe and Far East, I think. It's pretty much everything outside of Canada. But I think EAFE stands for Europe and Far East. I'm pretty sure about that. Or maybe Europe, Asia, Far East, whatever. Anyways, these are what I use. Did I say anyways? Anyway, this is what I use for uh, by proxy for foreign stocks. Now, I don't think that you could use foreign stocks to predict our market. But it is a piece of the puzzle that's worth considering. If foreign stocks are weak, then that's, that scores in the minus column against our market. Now, again, I'm always saying I don't think that the tail could wag the dog. Um, but I will admit in more recent years, the foreign markets are beginning to gain power. And maybe we're losing a little bit of power here. I hate to say that as a, as a red-blooded American. But one begins to wonder. But I'll tell you, I used to never pay attention to the EFA shares, and now I do. I think it's, it's something you need to look at daily. Let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty has become one of my favorite, I almost said indicators, but maybe indicator is not the wrong word, favorite indexes to uh, analyze. And the Rusty did break out past this 108, basis the IWM. I just used the IWM ETF as a proxy. It came up. It went a little sideways in here. It looked like a little bit of a double top knockout, but then it returned all the way back to the base last Friday. And this had me somewhat concerned. Felt a little bit better earlier in the week, and then what happens on Wednesday turns around and goes right back down, and then now we're back to the base again. So, again, you've got a breakout followed by a 100% retrace. It's not the end of the world, but if the Russell gets below 108, you certainly want to pull in your horns a little bit in here. So there's a case of a base breakout followed by a pullback. And again, it's a little bit more indicative of what's going on in the broader market. Uh, we got a few questions stacking up. So we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to answer these questions first, and then we'll look at the overall market. Then we'll jump into individual stocks. But when we get to the uh, stocks, you'll see that there's been some debacle de jours as of late. I'll show you those. There's been some sectors such as biotech, which got whacked yesterday. The whole sector got whacked 3%. So we'll get into that in just one second. So the Russell, again, a little bit more indicative of what's going on uh, internally in the market. Okay, And again, uh, debacle de jours, uh, one has to wonder, are they canaries in the coal mine? And then, again, this is random thoughts left over from last, last week. They're still valid. We're kind of in a tale of two markets. You've got the Dow making these new highs, which is a good thing. I don't get as excited about the Dow as the media does. And then you got the S&P just off of new highs today, notwithstanding. 
that's a little bit more important, obviously, than the Dow because that's 500 stocks. But the NASDAQ is lagging, and then the Russell, which is a broad-based index, is lagging. And, and, and I hate to say it, it never ceases to amaze me because I've seen it enough to where I begin to um, understand that this is how it works. But I like to look at several thousand stocks every day, and in doing so, I get a good feel for what's really happening within the market. And often I'll say, wow, today was kind of a weak day. And then when I get around and look at the Russell, I'll see the Russell be down 1%. And I'll go, up. Ah, that confirms it. So if you didn't know anything, take a look at the Russell to give you a pretty darn good feel for what really happened internally. All right, we're getting some questions stacking up that are trading. Hang on, hold on to your uh, stock picks just for a few minutes. And we'll get to those as soon as I get to the charts. Okay. John is saying the stop limit is the hardest to set properly. The stop limit will determine the R risk per trade and also the profit target, which will match the R value. Now, keep in mind, we spent uh, about an hour on this a few weeks back. I don't know. I'm guessing you were here, John, because the week before we did, this is what inspired um, the uh, webinar. If the R is too small, this means it's a stop limit will be too tight and it will be easier to get stopped out. That is correct. If the R is too loose, it will be harder to hit the initial profit target as a reversion to the need effect will lessen as price moves towards the price target. So he's saying that if it's far away, it will be harder for it to get hit. Well, let's think about that. Did I just lose my blank screen? I think I did. That stinks. And I think I accidentally deleted out my... Let me see if I can bring it back. Well, we could just draw on one of these screens. And tell you what, let me just create a new one. Talk amongst yourselves. Let's see if there's a way to do this. Well, we'll just, we'll just draw on a blue screen. This will work. Okay. So he's saying that, oh, I know what we could do. Let's, let's just go to the uh, nutshell screen. So he's saying if the stop is too tight, it's more likely to get hit on noise alone and uh, as opposed to getting to the initial profit target. He says if it's too loose, the reversion of the mean move will happen and the stock will stop before it gets there. Okay. Now let's see what else is he saying. What are the ways to set... R value properly besides a, using ATR support level, etc. It would be it also be differently depending on market conditions, choppy trend, trading, etc. What are your thoughts about the support R value? This could also be discussed in a separate webinar as well. Yeah, John, um, that's that's the art. That's where the art comes in. And I have a slide in here. Let's see if I can find it quickly. That might answer some of those questions. And this is all part. This comes out of the stock selection uh, process. And in the stock selection process, one thing I was explaining is, is the pullback too deep? Is the pullback deep enough? And then the fact that you never know whether or not the stock has finished its correcting. So let me see if I can find the, uh, just give me a second to see if I can find the, the chart on this. And we'll talk about this dilemma. Oh, I know what to do.
Okay. Now, what I'm saying here is, let's say a stock pulls back. What we're looking to do is obviously get in that pullback and hopefully catch a resumption of trend. But sometimes that market isn't finished correcting. And that's why we use a little bit more liberal stop, just in case that market comes down and finishes the correction. And then hopefully, and I hate to use the word hope, begins to take off again. This would be a textbook stop right below the low of the market. Now, John pointed out, John, John, you understand a lot more than you think you do. You might not just have experienced enough market conditions to reap the fruits of your labor. Because you get it. I mean, your, your questions are very well thought, and you explain a lot of things. You, do, you take my job out of the equation quite a bit. Because John was saying that, hey, I understand if you could have a shallow pullback in a rip-roaring bull market or a, a trending market, and that's, what it, that's precisely what I wrote about. It's like, okay, if you have what I call like a flag pattern or what other people call a flag pattern too, you could have these real shallow pullbacks like I have sort of illustrated in here. And the market could just take off and not look back. Now, ideally, if you went through your stock selection process and the stock is at a persistent trend and made like a nice little TKO or made like a nice pullback, it has all these other characteristics and all these trend qualifiers in the direction of the trend and trades cleanly. And all of these things we talk about week after week and then that would spend a weekend or at least a day out of the weekend talking about, then you know you're going into the best of the best, provided, of course, that the sector and other stocks within the sector are also looking pretty good. And there's nothing better within the sector, like, like we talked about a few minutes ago, that looks even better. And the overall market's looking pretty good. Then by all means, um, you might be in such a good stock that it might just trigger and not look back. So if you, if, you, if you put all that stuff together, your chances of catching a winter stock are pretty good. But yes, sometimes that correction might not be over with, so that looser stop will help to keep you in that trade. Now, he's saying that if your stop is too far away, then the reversion of the need move begins to happen and it doesn't get to the initial profit target. Well, hopefully all those things I just said, the trend and the cleanness and the persistency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are going to help that stock get past that reversion to the mean move. So he's saying that the reversion to the mean is so far it gets you, how do you get the rest of it in here? In other words, reversion to the mean, meaning that a stock tends to oscillate between oversold, I'm sorry, overbought and oversold, or vice versa, either way. So he's saying that if your stop is way down here, meaning that your profit target's way up here, by the time you get about right there, your reversion to the mean move is done. That is true, but hopefully all these other things we just talked about are going to kick in and that reverts to the mean move just because you're halfway there, and then the rest of it will be a resumption of the trend to get you to that profit target. Now, that's saying that the stop is too wide. Stops are a Goldilocks type of deal, just like just like a pullback is a Goldilocks type of deal. Uh, if it's if pullback is too deep, then you retrace 100% of that trend. It's no longer a pullback. We just talked about these base breakouts that look like that. Okay, So that's no longer a pullback because you've given up 100% of the trend. If they're too shallow, then the market hasn't corrected it up. It hasn't shaken out enough people. Think about what happens on a pullback. Stocks going up, everybody's happy, starts going down. People who bought late in the game are not happy. Those are the people who are going to be the quickest to dump the stock. So they'll they rush it at the last moment and rush out at the first moment, at the first signs of I should say not the first moment, but the first signs of some sort of adverse move. So if you can shake out the nervous hands, shake out the weak money, and that's the theory behind the TKO, and that's one of my favorite patterns, because when that happens, it knocks those people out of the market. It also attracts eager shorts. Shorts tend to think, well, a stock is overvalued. The stock does not know, deserve that ridiculous value. They do tend to confuse the issue with facts. I think shorts have some particular shorts, not all shorts, but the shorts that are shorting a stock up here at these high levels, just when it begins to pull back a little bit, I think that they have a bit of an egotistical problem. They have a bit of an ego problem, and they're more concerned about catching a top, I think, than making money. They're more concerned about being right than making money. And that's one thing, I don't want to digress too far, but that's one thing I see a lot in this business is people just want to be right, and so much so 
that they're more concerned about being right than making money. So the shorts come piling in. So on a pullback, if you get all these people, you get the shorts sucked in and the longs knocked out, at least the nervous longs knocked out, then sometimes that clears the way for it to go higher. So you're looking for the reversion to the mean move, and then you're also looking for everything else to kick in too. Yes, it is a Goldilocks scenario. You have to look at the recent bars and determine it, where you, can you place that stop. But you also have to factor in the pattern itself. If a stock is way down here, it's already stretched pretty far. So maybe, maybe you could use a stop a little bit looser than, statistic, than statistics would suggest. Okay, because if you start using ATRs or stops, a lot of times they're going to be a lot looser than you probably want them to be. So that's another thing to think about is where's your pattern? How far stretched is that market in some particular cases? Sometimes the mean reversion players are trying to catch that falling knife uh, because they hope, it uh, they hope it's going to resume or, I'm sorry, reverse. Not resume, but reverse. So what we're doing is we're waiting to see if it gets, begins the rally. It, before it begins to rally, before we consider getting into that market, okay? Um, I'm not sure I answered your question. As usual, John, you bring up uh, good fodder. Fodder? Fodder? Fodder. <laughs> you bring up good fodder for um, further shows. So let me chew on that a little bit and see what I can come up with. Uh, if you don't mind, um, cut and paste that and, and send it to me in the email, okay? All right. Frenchie and quite a few other people in here are asking me about Twitter. Any ideas on a Twitter IPO? Here's my take on IPOs. Wait for, wait for them to become, wait, blah, blah. wait for them to come public. Um, and then make a decision, okay? You won't know how this IPO is going to be perceived until it comes public, okay? And Facebook is, and I used a, um, I recently wrote about a bunch of these IPOs, and Facebook was my poster child. I showed a few obscure IPOs that came public and this just kind of nosedive. And after I got through building my case, I said, okay, well, you're probably thinking that's some obscure IPO. And then what about the most hyped and exciting IPO in history? Well, look what Facebook did. It came public here. And what did it do? It just imploded. So if you were lucky enough to get shares, <laughs> you better hope that you dump them quickly before the stock begins to implode. I think anything, any talk from here backwards, and well, let me draw a trend line, but any talk from here backwards on an IPO is academic at best. Um, you want to know what I think Twitter's going to do? I think Twitter's going to take a nosedive like Facebook. But there's been some naysayers out there on Twitter, so maybe it'll go higher. On Facebook, everybody was so darn excited that it was like, well, who's left to buy? So there's some naysayers on Twitter. I personally think it's going to go to hell in a handbasket. But who knows? We won't know. So with an IPO, what you want to do is you want to wait until that IPO proves itself and then look to get in on the first pullback. If all you did, and I've said this before, but I'm going to pay for your webinar right now. If all you did was trade IPOs after they come public and prove themselves, on the first pullback, and, and I probably shouldn't say this because it's some research that I'm doing, but uh, maybe even, maybe even on a breakout, then I think you might do pretty darn good. And let me see if I could show you some examples of that. Someone on the fly in here. Um, well, here's a good example of what not to do. Notice the stock goes all the way up. And it comes all the way down. Okay, let's take a look at some more IPOs. Okay, fate. Look at the fate of this one. It takes off, but then look what happens. It comes all the way back in. This is why you don't want to trade IPOs when they first come out. Take a look at this MYCC. I've already got it marked up. Came public, didn't do much, and then imploded. This is why you want to let them trade 
Here's, well, that's a VIX volatility. Forget about that. So you want to see how it's going to be perceived in the open market before you decide to trade it. Okay, I think SCTY was a good example recently. Let me, let me see if we could punch that one up and go back to the offer date. Okay. Now this one hasn't been around forever. Now here's one of our bigger winners or of the year. And what do we do with this one? So let's 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 take a look at how to trade and how not to trade an IPO. This will be this will be good fodder for next week's research too. All right, Solar City comes public. There's probably some excitement about this stock out there. Solar is a hot thing, no pun intended. But what does it do? It just drops like a stone. It loses about 30, 40 percent of its value over the first one, two, about first week or so. But then it begins to rally, and then it starts looking pretty good. Okay. And this is why we came in at this point here and entered this stock because it began to prove itself in the open market, about 60% rally from its lows, and then begins to pull back. Okay, So let me repeat. If all you did was trade IPO pullbacks and breakouts to a lesser extent, I haven't completed the research on that yet, so I'm not sure just yet. There's a, The reason I say not just yet is there's a survival bias with these IPOs. So let's say an IPO comes public, dives like a rock, and goes bank bankrupt. Well, that's no longer going to be in my database. And at some point, I need a survivor database, and I need to work on that type of thing, too. There's only one of me here. I need to get a staff. I need to do all these things. I guess I like the freedom, and I have a bit of that entrepreneur spirit. feel like i got to do everything myself. But anyway, I digress. But that's some research that's on my plate. And you can see it had a bit of a slow start in here. But this stock did eventually begin to trade very nicely. So what you want to do with Twitter is see what it does. Let it open. Let it trade. Let's see what happens. And then if it starts to take off like this SCTY did, then by all means play that first little pullback, okay? It's okay to give it a little – it's okay to give up that first little move in here. Look at this particular case. It went from 15 to 40 bucks. So you had at least a double on the trade, better than the poke in the eye. Okay. All right. Arsony wants to know. You mentioned liberal entries. What do you mean? Okay. A textbook entry will put you long. And let's just talk about buys because it's easier to talk about buys. Right above the high. So if you're seeing this pullback. Let's say this is Monday, so Tuesday you're going to enter right there. You're going to enter right above this high. That's a textbook entry. Okay, A liberal entry would mean give it a little bit of wiggle room. You have layman's. If you look at layman's, you'll see that – what page would that be on? It should, I think it's in a chapter – may I have your order, please? Chapter 7 in looking there. So you want to use – well, that's a stop entry. Maybe not. Anyway, it's in it's in there. We talk about a wiggle room type of entry, uh, which is also what I call a liberal entry. When I say liberal, give it quite a bit of room before the trigger. And that in and of itself can keep you out of a lot of bad trades. And it really has kept us out of a lot of bad trades this year. Am I hiring? <laughs> I don't know, Thomas. What do you have to offer? We'll see. Um <laughs> I might be interested in a partnership. I don't know if I want an employee. It's like uh last thing I want is a human resources department. Okay, John says another another similar question. Is it good to trail as a price as it moves in your favor before you take the initial profit? Yeah, that's another good question. John really makes me think. Um the question is, should you trail before like I have it here, before it hits the initial profit? Um in trading, there's always a trade-off. If you don't trail, okay, let's say there's your stop, and you're going to wait for this move to occur, and then you're going to trail, the chances of getting this initial profit target are much, 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 much better. Unfortunately, if it doesn't work out, then your losses are going to be bigger, okay? There are quite a few times where I trail a stop higher, and I get stopped out at a loss, that's much smaller than the full 2% that I risk, it, risk of the trade. So there's always a trade-off. 
Now, what I've been doing in more recent times, since the markets have become a little bit more choppy in more years, and you guys might have picked up on this a little bit in the service, is if the stock moves up just a little bit, a tiny bit in here, I'm not so quick to, to bump up that stop, that little tiny bit like I have in here. I might give it a little bit of wiggle room, but I'm not going to do this, wait for this to get hit, and then make that quantum leap in the stop up. What I still, what I'm still doing is I'm, I'm ratcheting it higher, but maybe not on a, on a one tick by tick basis. But yes, there's always a trade-off. If you're willing to just go in and do that, put that protective stop in, and not uh, trail it higher as it moves in your favor until it hits the initial profit target, then yeah, that works. Uh, quite frankly, what I do on the institutional side of my business. Uh, just to help my accuracy a little bit, and because I'm dealing with big boys, I, and I don't want to, I don't want to give um, constant micromanagement, for lack of a better word. That's exactly what I do. I lay out a trade, and if you look at my institutional research, I'll say I think it has the potential to continue higher. Um, and a short-term goal would be here, and maybe a long-term goal would be somewhere up here. Okay, And I'll say, here's a stop. And then I'll say, this is where we're going to take partial profits. And then once we get to this level, then I give new instructions. Then I update the stop and give new instructions. Okay, uh, In a trading service, as the stock moves in our favor, I make a decision each day whether or not to bump that stop up a little bit, and I put that out every day in my trading service. So neither way is 100% correct, okay, and trading is always a trade-off. Uh, what I do on the institutional side by waiting for that to get hit, I catch more winners, and as long as I catch a few winners, I look pretty good, and I'm able to stay uh, a consultant or whatever you want to call me, okay. So Either way is okay. It, it all depends on what you're more comfortable with. You're more likely to get stopped out and not get that initial profit target if you don't trail before it gets hit, okay, before the initial profit target is hit, that is. Uh, but if it doesn't work out, you're obviously going to lose more per trade, okay? So, yeah, John, whatever works better for you. I think, I, I think you're wrestling with it too much, and I think you're – Picking it apart too much, which I think you have to do when you're when you're learning to some extent. But then, at some point, you're going to have to accept the way it is, okay? And realize that you can't change markets and you can't work on exacts. As long as your stop is loose enough within reason, then you can maybe do a little bit of a hybrid or both. Maybe wait for it to move a couple of points in your favor, uh, assuming it's a higher price stock before you start ratcheting that stop higher. I mean, if I'm trading a more volatile stock that's at higher levels, something like TAN, which we're long, which sucks today, by the way, but uh, I, I, I hope I was muted earlier when I dropped an F-bomb. Um, you know, I'm not going to ratchet that. If it goes up a point, which you could do in, in 10 seconds or 10 minutes, I'm not going to ratchet that stop up one point. I'm just going to let it give it a little bit of more wiggle room. So there's no exact right way to do things, but I can give you a general sketch of what to do and the benefits of one over the other, and whatever works best for you, um, that's what you should um, do, okay? Yeah, can you, I don't know if you can cut, and, can you cut and paste all this, or can I do that out of here? You know what, I might be able to get these questions later. We'll do that, okay? Steven says, regarding multiple time frame analysis, is a particular time frame that is best to use as a perspective for the time one is trading? If hourly is trading, five minute weekly trading uh, daily over time. Okay. Um, I'm a big fan of Russian doll type of analysis. Okay. And if you look at my website, geez, from a long time ago, I think I wrote an article about Russian dolls. And if anybody's ever seen a Russian doll, it's like a little doll, and then inside the little doll is a little doll. And you know, that's inside a bigger doll. And so, so you've got this Russian doll analysis where you've got a time frame inside a time frame inside a time frame. Um, I knew a day trader once that would, that would look at weeklies and monthlies and, and long, long, long-term charts, okay? And then he would go in and, and look at like a five-minute chart and take a little piece out because he knew that he had this trend or this trend behind him. There's nothing wrong with doing that. 
The only problem comes in, as I've said before, is let's say you've got a stock that looks like this, and it's just an absolutely beautiful type of first thrust or a bow tie or some sort of other nice looking pattern on the daily chart, okay? Just a beautiful chart. Well, if you look at the long term chart, the weekly chart, the weekly chart is going to look like that. And you might even have to squint your eyes to see a little pullback. That pullback here on the daily chart is a major change in trend or a potential major change in trend. If you wait until this weekly begins to look like that, you might miss the hundred you might miss one hundred percent of that move. And that's why I do trade off a daily chart. It's especially important to trade off a daily chart um, on the short side because they slide faster than they glide. On the long side, you might be able to just, and this is another thing, maybe if, if all you did, if all you did was wait for stocks to go down and make major, 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 major lows, such as all type lows, and then trade a bow tie off the weekly chart, I bet you would be a successful trader. In fact, I think you'd do very well. You would have to be one of the most patient persons in the whole world, though. In fact, it's kind of funny. I, I um, occasionally go on these webcasts each week, and these guys tend to be more day trader types um, with Doug Newberry and um, and Bill McKinley, and they do a little uh, weekly show every week too. And, and every now and then they'll they'll pop in and see if I want to pop in their show, or they'll Skype me, or whatever. And I'll go in and speak with them on an hour or so. Anyway. Um, and it's kind of funny, even though I'm a daily trader, and even though they're day traders, they have a fascination with the weekly bow ties. And whenever I go on a show, we'll talk about stocks that are in weekly bow ties making major, major bottoms. And they're, uh, they're going to start tracking these things. So stay tuned on that. Longer term, it might be kind of interesting to see if we catch some really major bottoms um, in that. And, and they kind of remind me of the importance of that, even though they're day traders uh, for the most part, or shorter term traders, I should say. Now. The question is, what time frame should you look at? Um, all of them. Why not? Okay. But don't let one – you have to determine what type of trader you are. I trade off daily charts. So if i got a setup that I really, really like, let's say that that beats my specifications as a great-looking setup, I'm not going to go out and look at a weekly chart and let that weekly chart change my mind. In an ideal world, yes. Your five-minute chart looks like this, or I should say – like this, pull back. Your daily chart looks like this. Your monthly chart looks like this. Your weekly chart looks like that, whatever. And you have that Russian doll analogy. You have that small time frame nested, I think is the key word I'm looking for, within that bigger time frame, then by all means. But for the most part, you want to pick a time frame and stick with that time frame and trade from that time frame. So it's okay to have confirmation. But just realize that, especially doing a transition type of setup, you might not have that confirmation in a trend. Okay. In fact, if I think if I did, uh, I started an article a while back called "If I Did It." If I did day trade, I would intraday position trade, and if I did that, I would certainly have some bigger picture pattern working in my favor. And maybe even as far as like finding a market that's extremely overbought. Okay, even though it's going up, and then look for like an intraday bow tie or something to capture that intraday trend on that. So uh, when you begin to nest those time frames, if you're a day trader, sometimes you might actually end up doing something a little bit more contra. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. But yeah, there's no specific pat, uh, one you want to look at. Okay, all right, thank you, uh, Armin, uh, pointing out a trigger in a stock. I see that now. Okay. Sure, well, let me know if you need me to email you the questions again. Okay. Thank you, John. Okay, Peter says, I use a weekly chart beside the daily only for only for quickly see the profit potential for a support resistance area. Yeah, and I, I, I used to do that. And um, let me see if I can do that, show you how I did that. I used to do that in that what I did was... I don't know if this is going to work or not, so bear with me. <laughs> oh, you know what? We could do it over here. What I did was this. I would come into my tradable universe, and I've experimented with quite a few things over the years. 
And I've got two, I think as, as big as they allow me to, to put side by side. I think they're 21, 235, 235 G235 is the, is the model number of my, the monitors I'm using for this show. And that's the biggest monitor I could, I could put sideways. So um, I'm guessing they're 23 inches each. It's so funny. I remember when I got my first 17 inch monitor and it was about a thousand bucks. And that was huge just to have a monitor that big. <laughs> now I got 20, I got a 70, 60 something inch TV. I use as a monitor too, but I digress. Um, the question is, he's saying he's using them weekly. Okay. What I do in my individual charts is, let me go to my tradable universe, is if you're looking at my actual screen, it'll look a lot like this. And over here, what I have is a daily chart. And let me get to some real charts in here, get me through all this stuff here. Hang on one second. Something went not a ridiculous HP. The problem is I weeded out a lot of stocks from this list. But anyway, what I want to do is I want to look on the right side of my screen to see the longer-term potential of the chart. For instance, this one here, not that I would ever trade this stock, but you could see up around 50, it could have some overhead um, supply. I'm looking at the daily chart on one side, and I'm looking at a long-term daily chart on the other. Now, what this gentleman is doing, uh, Peter, is um, he is... What he does is he just keeps the weekly on one side of his chart to gain perspective, and and I keep the daily on one side. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, in fact, that's exactly how I used to do it. But I found in more recent times, I just like to do last five years or ten years, whatever. I like to. Um, I've been around as long as dirt. <laughs> I like to just have a daily on both of these charts. But this is exactly what my charts look like. Um, obviously spread out a little bit more. So, yeah, that's okay to have a weekly on one side to give you some longer-term potential. And it might point out that longer-term um, support or resistance, I guess overhead resistance for longs or supports for shorts in here. But, yeah, I do like to see, like in this particular case, okay, here's a stock at low levels just coming off of a low-level base. It's why it's loose. I wouldn't necessarily trade it. But you could see that this chart over here, shows you that th these are major, major lows way down here, and the stock might have the potential to return back to its old high. So, yeah, it gives you a lot of perspective, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, good job with that. I agree with you 100% on that. Let's get a couple of questions out, and then we'll hop into the overall market. Okay. Has Twitter actually uh, opened yet? Let me punch it up on another screen just in case it opens at some point. TWTR. Yes, it is trading. Let's see if we have it in um it's not in um doesn't seem to be in a whatever you call this thing. Let me take a look at the chart. Okay, let's take a look at um while I'm waiting to see if Twitter will come up, uh, let's see if we can get a chart on this. Oh, here it is. Uh, yeah, you guys can go ahead. You start asking about individual stocks. That's fine. Uh, what I want to do first is take a look at the overall market. Then I want to whittle it down to um, some things. Yeah, I'm not getting a chart on Twitter for some reason, even on, excuse me, my, my expensive feed. And uh, Mountain Dew's kicking in. Okay, let's take a look at the P's. And then let's work our way out. Let me get my quote feed up over here. So I can, uh, I feel like I'm blind when I'm on my quote feed. Okay, um, the P's. Well, as of this morning, they were looking pretty darn good because they were just shy of all-time highs, and you certainly don't want to argue with that. Now, today is a new piece of the puzzle, and you can see that if you draw a horizontal line, in fact, we could even measure it if you want, uh, we've only gone up a little bit more than 30%, eh, maybe a half percent, 
in um, three weeks or so. So that's concerning. Now, as long as the market can hover around at or around these all-time highs, I wouldn't get too bearish, okay, on the um, stock. Greg says uh, trading opened at 45, went to 50, dropped to 45 within an hour. Yeah, I'm showing it up 20, but I don't know what that 20 is from. Up 19, 19 on Twitter. Um, P is kind of flat in here, as you can see. This is what I've been worried about in the NASDAQ. And now the P's are beginning to take on that appearance a little bit. It's each day you get a new clue in here. Again, it's not the end of the world, but I'd like to see some new highs sooner rather than later. Now, the NASDAQ looks a little bit worse than the P's. You can see that it's been trading sideways a little bit longer term in here. And now, with today's action so far, it's beginning to break down out of that range. Not the end of the world. And ideally, you want to see it turn around and go right back up. Longer term, you can see trends still intact. Shorter term, though. We get into breakdown a little. Let's take a look at the moving averages. You can see with today's action that 10 day moving average rolled over in here. And it's also caused that 20 and that 30 to flatten out a little bit. Those are EMA averages, and the 10 is a simple moving average. Okay. See the bow ties in my books for that. So that is a little bit of a cost of concern. It's not the end of the world, but it's something that we might want to pay attention to. Let's add in the 50-day moving average and see what that is. And I've got a lot more markets to get to, so uh, let me start to pick up the pace here a little bit. Let's take a look at a 50-day simple. And you can see the 50-day simple is about 3,800. Well, the cool thing about technical analysis is a lot of times technicals all come together at the same point, and that's kind of fascinating. So no matter what you use, you end up with the same number. So you can see that the 50-day moving average is right around 3,800. I'm not a huge fan of moving averages. I do like the bow ties, though. And I have found that the 50, as a general statement, we talk about this quite often, or every time the market retraces back to it at least, the 50-day moving average, and let's clean this chart up, can, and can be in the keyword in that sentence, can help to keep you on the right side of a market, especially if you use the concept of daylight, meaning that if the lows are greater than the moving average. You can see that the lows have been greater for the moving, than the moving average for a lot of this trend that we've been in, for 2013. So, so far, so good. Shorter term, though, beginning to break down a little bit out of this range. Ideally, you know me, I want to see some new highs sooner rather than later. Let's just take a look at the Dow. Not that I care to, but there's a lot of excitement in the Dow because it made new highs. But until it made those new highs, or until very recently, notice it was just kind of wide and loose, extremely wide and loose, and mostly sideways. Where was it months and months ago? Okay. Uh, 15,500. Where is it now? A little bit above 15,500. So I wouldn't get too excited about the Dow just yet until it follows through to the upside. I'd watch the P's a little bit more carefully than the Dow. Here's our EFA shares we just talked about. As you can see, again, they've retraced 100% of their recent little breakout in here. Not the end of the world, but certainly a piece of the pie or a piece of the puzzle. However you want to look at it. I'm on a low-carb diet, so pie would be great right now pie or some pasta <laughs> or a beer um let's take a look at at biotech let's take a look at some of these sectors in here uh bio oh, before we do that let's take a look at the, the iwm again we talked about this a little while ago it has retraced 100 percent of its breakout and now it's just kind of hanging in here but look at it's it's hanging in here right above this uh 108 level continue to keep an eye on that level if it drops below that then um I'd be concerned. Let's take a look at biotech. Biotech got whacked in here. It was that about 3% yesterday? It's looking a little questionable. Let's take a look at biotech, the, the MG group. What I see in this MG group is a little bit more scary than what's being shown in the IBB. And what I see here is, anyone see it? Okay. I see a head and shoulders top beginning to form. And that's a little bit concerning. And you can see the moving average bow ties. Didn't really make a clean bow tie in here, but now they're trying to roll back over in here. So that's looking a little questionable. 
Uh, even on a weekly chart, you can see it's kind of going a little sideways in here. It kind of lost some longer term momentum. So that's something you want to watch in here. Um, metals and mining are doing okay in here, down a little today, but they did kind of break out a little bit. Um, keep in mind with the metals, I'm a little bit more lenient because it's commodity related than I would be in some of these other areas. So that's been improving. Steel has been really leading the way there to a somewhat lesser extent. Copper has been doing okay too. Let's zoom in on that steel. Okay, you can see steel has been in a pretty good run as of late. Gold and silver, though, uh, within that sector have been lagging, and that's no big surprise if you take a look at gold, the commodity itself. Just kind of really not doing a whole lot in here. Where is it now? 125. Where was it uh, in July? 125. Okay. So if you didn't know anything about technical analysis, then you would just say, where is the market now? Where was the market three months ago? Oh, it's the same? Well, it doesn't look like it's going up then. It looks like it's going sideways, right? That's all you got to do. Okay, and there's silver too. Ditto for silver, kind of sideways at best. But within metals and binding, steel and iron looking pretty good. Um, everything else is becoming a bit of a mixed bag in here. The banks, which have been doing really well, have now traded lower for the most part for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. You're going on three weeks of trading lower in the banks. And again, in all these sectors, kind of notice, kind of eyeball the recent breakout-ish areas and notice that a lot of these areas have come back in. So it's a developing situation. I hate to say that because every day it's a developing situation, but you can see that it's getting really mixed out there with some sectors are still doing okay, but a lot of sectors are beginning to pull back to their prior breakouts. Some sectors like uh, biotech not doing so well. The shipping stocks within transports have been doing pretty good as of late, but then they got whacked the last couple of days, so now they're kind of coming back to their prior little breakout point too. So pay attention to those prior breakout points. I think that's very relevant, and I think uh, this week is probably the best week for me to cover something like that. Ditto for something like uh, the semis. You can see the semis tried to break out and came back in. So it's getting kind of mixed out there in spite of what the Dow says, or Dow said yesterday, or might say later today if it goes positive. Keep in mind, it's only 30 stocks. And it's not irrelevant, but it's often not that relevant. Okay? Hopefully that made sense. Okay? John says, might need to take my out as a potential trade long after today's move. What do you think? Okay. Um, any more any more questions on sectors or anything? Let's go ahead and open up for stocks. Yeah, in fact, this my came off of my momentum list a few days ago. And you can see we've got it drawn in here. Um, if we back this chart out a few days, or quite a few days, I should say, it looked pretty good. But now it's too long in the tooth. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. That's three weeks. 16, 17. you got almost a month's worth of the stock trading lower. The other thing you need to pay attention to, and this is, again, part of the stock selection process is, notice the percentage of this prior leg higher that has been retraced. So when you see a deep retracement, especially if it's over several weeks, you know that that stock may be done. At least it's done in terms of a um, pullback, okay? So absolutely, that needs to come off of your radar, okay? Okay, AKS, that's going to be a steel stock for Andre. Yeah, I mean, this, this needs to be on your momentum list, but it's certainly not set up just yet. The other thing you got to watch in here is you do have a lot of overhead supply between 5 and 6. So that right there would probably keep me out of this stock. Even though that overhead supply is about a year ago, you got to keep in mind that markets have bad memories. Yes. All this trading throughout here and all this sideways trading you had, probably some tax loss selling. Somebody might have died, unfortunately, and their sons and daughters or whoever got to hold their accounts and then liquidated them. Um, somebody might have got a divorce and had to liquidate at least half of their stock. So there could have been a lot of things that happened over the last year and a half from when we had this overhead supply. But markets still have pretty long memories. People will 
hold on to stocks sometimes for a long, long time. Once a stock gets away from them, they tend to just write it off in their head and let it go. Okay. So it would have to get maybe above six for me to get excited. See, here, here's the deal. Let's let's plot the industry uh, on this stock, okay? So here's your stock here, and this is what the industry looks like, okay? So if the industry itself looks like this, I'd be willing to bet if it lets me draw an arrow. Yeah, if the industry itself looks like that, I'd be willing to bet that you could find something that's trending even better within steel. What did I say a few minutes ago? A good-looking stock in one sector might look lead to a great-looking stock within that sector. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Andre, that's a better looking one. This one was on my lander list recently, and it triggered uh, a few days ago. Um, I just, I kind of like this one. And it does have some bad memories to it, I know. I just got through talking about bad memories, but it's not like a tremendous amount. You've got some wide and loose trading back here. You do have a little bit of bad memories here. But if you go back to like that prior stock, you had quite a bit. Now, you had all this trading in, like in the prior stock. But notice that this is up around 6. It's going to hit a few bumps along the way. But if this stock goes from 2 bucks and change to 6 bucks, I'm going to be so damn happy. I could care less if it stops then, okay? So the distance that the overhead resistance both in vertical – in horizontal, horizontal, how far back it is. At vertical, how high it is. Help you to judge. It won't let me draw an up thing. How high it is. Help you to judge whether or not it's important. If it's 100% away or 200% away or 300% away, screw it. I'll trade it anyway. Okay. But anything less than 100%, you need to start thinking about, well, is, is the potential for a reasonably unlimited trade possible or can my stock be capped at a certain level if your stock can be capped at a certain level then you might want to avoid it okay do you wait for nor to consolidate more before believing in the current uptrend well this is a transitional pattern which is a little bit more advanced and a little bit tougher to trade and a little bit tougher to get your arms around but the stock makes an all-time low here okay I think it's all time uh, it looks like it's going to be all time. Let's take a look at a monthly chart, maybe. Yes. That's an all-time low right here in October. And it begins to rally off that low. Now, keep in mind, when a stock rallies off of its low like that, everybody back here is on the wrong side of the market, okay? So all those shorts are going to be squeezed out. Uh, when in doubt, take the chart out. And you can see that's been a pretty good run in here, even though when you put the chart back in, your eye might not catch that run. That's a pretty serious run off of lows as far as a transitional pattern goes. Now, it's not a longer-term obvious pullback that looks like this, looks like this. You could put a big old blue arrow in it and say, okay, that's a trend resumption pattern. I'm going to jump all over that. It's a little bit more stealthy in here, but you did make an all-time low, and you're pulling back off of those lows. Let me just see something for S&Gs. I was going to see if, where the weekly bow tie was in that, but it's, it's going to be a long time before a weekly bow tie. So, yeah, to answer your question, what's going to have to happen, John, if you're not already long, you know, or let it rally a little bit. Maybe let it rally to see if you can get through the shorter term overhead supply back here before looking to take action. Okay. A FOP on a weekly chart. Well, that'll be something fun to look at. A F O P. Advanced fiber. Um, well, it looks okay on a weekly, but it would really have to, to get about to 22 before I would be interested in it. If I traded weekly charts, let's put a weekly bow tie on this. What the heck? Just for S and G's. You know, that would be entry right there off a weekly chart on a bow tie. 
Would you have some false? You might have some false moves earlier, though. But if you could stomach it, if all you traded was weekly bow ties, I think you'd do okay on the long side. On the short side, you'd, I think it would take too long to catch up. Although the, um, if you get a bear market like 2007, 2008, you'd probably do okay. Any thoughts on NTRI? It's going to be Nutra Systems. You know, that's a diet I thought about, but I just don't like Nutra that much. TRI. There's probably three people in Louisiana just got that joke. A Nutria is a rat, large rat that comes from South America, kind of like a koi poo type of rat. It's an invasive species. In fact, in Louisiana, if you have a license, you can shoot them, cut the tail off, and get five bucks. And some industrious people will actually uh, ride around looking for neutrals and cutting tails off. If you find an old road, like in a swamp somewhere, you can go out on a Saturday night and cut a bunch of neutral tails off, dead road kills, bring them in for five dollars each. You come in, you get home stinky, but you uh, make a little money. So that's what a nutri is. We call them nutrients. Nutria is the real name. Anyway, Nutri Systems is a diet system, I think, that they deliver food to your house, and I just don't like Nutra that much. Um, it's got some longer term problems to it. My other problem too is I find these diet stocks, and I hate to say use the word fad, but you know, for lack of a better word, or no pun intended, they, te they tend to be a fad. They tend to take off, but then they implode. I mean, here's a great example here. Look what it did here, but then they just absolutely implode. So I guess they're just made to be traded, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, yeah, you can see it's broken out nicely. It had kind of a TKO type of move here, a little bit. Eh, it was a little bit too too far down. The trend wasn't that great when it had a TKO. But now that it's broken out, I think it looks okay. My only problem is you're going to have to ask yourself what a stock like this, because it can be such a fad stock, uh, is it priced for perfection, and can it really make a, another leg higher? I mean, it's kind of going straight up in here. And you do have a little bit of this overhead supply. But that's three years ago. So how much of that bad memories is left? I don't know. But I think I would pass on it. KWK for Phil. That's going to be Quicksilver. KWK, which is neither a quick or a silver stock. Um, it looked like it bottomed out in here, but then it pulled back too many days. Okay, And now it's kind of wide and loose. And if you back the chart out a little bit, it's got a lot of this wide and loose trading, and it's going to have a lot of bad memories along the way. And then you've got a lot of wide and loose trading back here. So it's going to have a hard time rallying up. If I were you, because it does look like the stock is putting at a major bottom, I would take a look at some of the other oils or other independent oils and see if there's something you like even better. Again, like I said, a great looking stock or a good looking stock, good looking setup in one stock might lead to a great looking setup. Yeah, now the art wants to take a look at FIS at all-time highs. FIS is Fidelity National Information Service. I have no idea what they do and if that means anything. Um, they didn't really break. It didn't really break out of this base decisively. You just have this one bar here, and it's not quite what I call a bottle rocket. But for lack of a better term, I talk about bottle rocket stocks where you have these one or two big wide-range bars, and that's it. Uh, it's not an extreme wide range bar, but the breakout is just one bar so far, and it's retraced most of that so far back to the base. Okay, so I don't know. I'd have a hard time getting excited about this stock unless it bursts higher, uh, more decisively. It's also a bit on the thin side. Oh, it's not thin side. I'm sorry. It's also a bit on the low volatility side. HV is kind of fairly low in here, so I think I'd pass on that one. I think you might be able to find better. MOC for Phil. MOC, is that going to be one of those? Uh, nope. I'm, I'm getting confused with something else. Uh, way too thin, Phil. I mean, as a private trader, you might be able to trade it, but it's too thin, and it doesn't have any structure. It just chops around, chops around. It looks like it, I don't know if it gets manipulated or what, but it's just too thin, too crazy to trade. Yeah, it's trying to break out from these lows, but be careful on that one. Gloria, STN. Good to see you, Gloria. I haven't seen you in these in a while. If ever. Gloria, that's a little thin. That's super thin. That's really thin, so be careful with that. But here's a case where a stock, it, it, it's super thin, but it trades a lot more cleanly than that prior stock. 
But yes, be extremely careful trading this. The other thing too is it did sort of bottle rocket in here where you just had these these two big days, these two big days in here higher. Um, they're not that extreme, so I wouldn't get that worried about it. But I think based on the fact that the stock is really thin, it's 9,000 shares. You come in and trade 1,000 shares or 500 shares, you're going to be a, a huge – let's say you did 500 shares, which is not too crazy maybe. 500 – what's that divided by 9? Thousands at 4.5%, 5.5%. So you're going to be 6% round number of the daily volume, maybe 10% of the daily daily volume. That's uh, that's quite a bit. Okay, I think my math's a little off, but you get the idea. Okay, A and R is going to be a uh, metal stock, I think. Alpha Natural Resources. Is that a coal stock? Uh, I'm going to give that one a not bad. Because it did make a pretty major bottom in here. Let's take a look at a long-term chart. Yeah, it's an all-time low, so that's always good. It did bottom out. Okay, it's got some bad memories along the way. But again, sometimes you have to be more lenient with these um, metals and mine. I'm going to give it an okay. I think it needs to pull back a little bit more deeply, though, uh, given the magnitude of its breakout. It's okay. I would dig through my other metals, no pun intended, and see if you could find something a little bit better, though. Okay. Don's here, and he would like to know about anyone? Ford. Well, Don, I got my arrow drawn in from last week. I've got my range drawn in from last week. So it's stuck in a range. And there's certainly nothing, there's no new action to take. Don, you're long. I know you are. Stay long. But um, there's certainly nothing to do there. Draw your arrows. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five months of sideways trading. Um, that is not a trend unless you want to trade a side which look at that zero <laughs> zero okay seven eight nine ten eleven that's four months okay zero so you certainly don't want to be in that stock I, I know Don you're never gonna we're gonna get forward away from Don when we pry it from his uh cold dark hands right TW Ah, uh, TW for Mr. Peter. He went short two, two days ago, stopped at 117. Well, that's a pioneer trade. Remember earlier I said these shorts like to, and I don't want to pick on you too much, Peter, um, but shorts tend to fight the trends a little bit. So that's the only thing that I would be a little scared about. I, I think you might be right because it looks like it's in trouble now, okay? And this is another one that might be, I don't know what they do, but it might be priced for perfection. Once they start getting up at these very high levels and they've been in a long trend for a year or two, then you have to ask yourself, is the stock priced for perfection? Okay. So you might have a tiger by the tail with this one. Well, it's not a tiger just yet. But I really don't see the setup unless you've traded like this little tiny micro first thrust, a micro gatekeeper in here. But, yeah, have a stop at, and this is where the shorts get, get clocked and cleaned out. Have a stop up here somewhere to where if it makes new highs, you know that you are wrong. Let's take a look at moving averages. You can see this thing's going to eventually bow tie down, and uh, you could be on you could be onto something there. I would not trade this one until it rolls over a little bit more and makes that bow tie or makes that first thrust type of pattern down. But hey, I'm not going to argue with your success if this thing uh, this thing does look like it's in trouble. So I'm going to give you a good eye on that. Okay. CENX for Don. Oops. CENX. Uh, no, I think you could do better than that. Okay. Okay. That's you get the electrocardiogram award of the day. Beep 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 beep. <laughs> and if you go to trade a stock, beep. So it's all over the place. That's a Nicholas Fine electrocardiogram. Let's take a look at the aluminium stocks. Okay. You're looking at this one, all right? Where was it 10 months ago? Well, it was at 8.50. Where is it now? 8.50. So it took it 10 months to go 0.34% down. So you can see that it's just not a stock that you want to trade. You can go way back. You can see it's maybe go further back than that. Let's see. Go back to 12, you know, go back 11 months. It's, it's done absolutely nothing on a net-net basis. Now, let's go to aluminium. 
and there's not that many aluminum stocks, okay? Well, Alcoa, today notwithstanding, it's getting whack, but you can see Alcoa looked a little bit better than that one. ACH is kind of sideways. Uh, this one's kind of sideways. This one's kind of sideways. That one's kind of all over the place. Uh, that one's super thin, Switzerland. But in general, you can see it's in an uptrend. This one looks like it's breaking down. Could be a possible short, kind of on the thin side, though. And NOR, which we talked about earlier, looks a lot better because it looks like it's kind of bottomed out and taken off. So... I would go with NOR a week ago as opposed to something like, um, what was it we're looking at? C and X? It's just all over the place. So I'd leave that one alone. Not too many aluminums. Look, it's good. Phil, that was on the, um, I had this one on my Landry list up until today or yesterday. And I'm kind of beating myself up on it. Let's take a look at it. We talked about this one potentially last week. It just got too crazy, uh, and that was a hard decision. Because if you back the chart way out, it looks like it's possibly making a longer-term bottom in here. Went sideways forever, straight up, then pulls back. HV 112. It's just it just got too crazy, and that's why I took it off my screen. Um, it might be a longer-term bottom, longer term, but I think at this juncture, it's it's, it's retraced too far. It's become too crazy so that's why I took it off and when you take a stock off your screen you just have to tell yourself self this thing may go to the moon and I'm not going to drop too many f-bombs if it does without me has glue pulled back too far for Mr. Brett G-L-U-U G-L-U-U -U. Uh, well not that it's pulled back too far which maybe it has but the thing that just jumps out at me as a no-go is this big fat gap right here so let's take a look at that Anytime you get a gap, I'm looking at how green this Mountain Dew is. That can't be good for you, huh? <laughs> I may have to find another drink. Red Bull won't sponsor me. I actually asked them. They told me I was too fat. Um, anytime you get a gap down after new highs, there's a lot of people. Everybody here is happy, right? And then you get a gap down. That's going to aggravate a lot of people, okay? And it just means that, that the stock may have, and I always mess it up, is it ran its course or run its course? May have ran its course, have ran, have run. Anyway, gap down. If I was seeing this was a higher price stock and that was an all-time high, I would say that would, be, that would look like a pretty darn good-looking short. But the fact that it's at lower levels, and it might be hard to borrow, too, because it's less than five bucks a share. Um, I would just pass all around on that one. Okay, BTU is going to be an energy-related type of stock. Is it British, British thermal units? British thermal units. Well, first of all, before we zoom in, I'm seeing some uh, some bad memories in this stock. Let's zoom in and take a look. Um, it's worked its way higher, but it hasn't really set the world on fire. 18 to 20, that's not that big of a move, okay? And it's pushing right into this overhead resistance shorter term. Um, I think I would pass on that one. What is that? That's a coal stock, or is that a, um, natural gas or something? Coal, maybe? RC wants to know about DDD. I saw where they printed a card. you guys see that? I didn't read the article, but it was the first car that was printed to those of you who may not know, DDD is a 3D printing company. Uh, I have this stock on my momentum list. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with it. As Doug Newberry says, uh, I love it and it hates my account. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's in a nice accelerated uptrend in here, maybe on a pullback. Uh, this one is just could be crazy. Though. The volatility of 42 doesn't fully reflect, reflect how crazy it is. Um, yeah, I would definitely keep it on a momentum list, maybe on a pullback. Let's talk about it next week. Let's see if it makes a TKO or something. Okay, Cliff is a long. That's going to be another M&M. &M. Uh, yeah, it's not too bad. you got a gap, and then you also have some overhead supply in here. We drew that in last week. Um, that was a year ago, but I wouldn't completely forget about it. I would pass on it based on that, but if you zoom in shorter term, it's a pretty good example of a stock that did break out, and so far is just pulling back. And then longer term, you're still coming off relatively low levels. 
So all this is good, okay? It's kind of Frankenstein stock, good. And then all this is bad or Tarzan stock, okay? So I would leave it alone based on that. THRM for arsenic, THRM, THRM, M or N? THRM. Oh, can't find it. Did I punch in the right thing? THRM. THRM. Thermal something, maybe? Oh, gen therm. Um, well, it has a little bit of a bottle rocket look to it because you've just got this one big wide-range bar, and now it's already begin to, begun to implode a little bit. If this was spread out over a few bars in here, as opposed to just one big bar, I think I'd be more inclined to go after it. One thing that I know that I meant to show you earlier that you may not have, you may not know because you're not looking at so many Doran charts every day, is that uh, this Dan, another auto parts store, recently imploded in here. So that one has to wonder: could that be the canary in the coal mine on the auto parts? Don't know. I, I'm not going to just um, say that never buy any auto parts because one stock or never buy a certain sector because one stock imploded. But it's certainly something you want to pay attention to. Now let's jump to the sub industry of auto parts. You can see, you know what? So far, it's doing fairly well in here. So auto parts, I guess, are still surviving. Uh, let's go to the subsector. Let's just see what's in the subsector. Oh, you got quite a few people in the subsector. That's interesting. Um, that was Dan. Look, there's another one. Looks kind of ugly. Put that on your short list, okay? Dave, what about DLPH? Oh, looks like it's in trouble. Put that on your short list. You're welcome. There's a stock. Look, it's breaking. There's your gap down after all-time highs breaking down. Um, could have a tremendous amount of overhead supply. I'm a little nervous to get into it just yet, but that certainly looks like a stock that could be in trouble pretty soon here. Look at that bow tie down. Okay. So all I'm saying here is just go into the sector and see if there's anything that looks a little better, or also see if everything's confirming. And I'm seeing a lot. I'm seeing a few stocks that are set up on the long side. But I've seen quite a few stocks in here that look a little questionable at best. So I don't know. I'd be real skeptical on this THRM, especially since it did that uh, bottle rocket up, and then it's already retraced a lot of that breakout so far. I think I'd leave that alone. In fact, I'm not seeing anything really, really I want to go after. If anything, there might be a short or two within that uh, sector. Pam, I think I liked that one a while back. A while back being a few days ago. This was on my Landry list for quite a while. Um, I liked it because it bottomed out in here over a course of about a year and a half. And then your bad memories are a long ways away, or fairly long ways away, in both vertical and horizontal distance, as we talked about a few seconds ago. Um, I liked the way it kind of took off, and then it kind of accelerated higher. Kind of had a little bit of a knockout move, but that didn't pan out, okay? So now you've got uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. You've got three weeks in the pullback. So I think I would now pass on this stock, even though it looked pretty good a couple of weeks ago. And luckily, we didn't get in it. How about GDX to just get a bead on the gold mining sector? GDX? Okay. GDX. GDX. Now, the gold miners, you need to look at GLD and the GAD, GLDX. The GLDX, you can see that if, if we continue to draw lines in here, is now back to its old lows and then just kind of going sideways. Um, it looks like the bottom here is going to be a process more than an event. So I would pass on uh, doing anything with that. It's just going sideways for now. Don wants to know about pot. Don't do it, Don. It's it's a... Uh, it's, it's, uh, Oh, the stock. Sorry. Okay. Um, that overhead resistance we talked about last week, the week before, the week before, the week before, the week before, it's still there. You had the big gap down, and you're just chopping around sideways, okay? We trade momentum. That's what momentum looks like, okay? Or we trade major transitions. So, no. Still don't like it. I uh, do not like it in a car. I do not like it in a bar. L-I-O-X. L-I-O-X. Okay, um, another one, it's, it's, it's kind of got this extreme melt-up look to it. Um, 
So is that sustainable? I don't think that's sustainable. It just is too wild and crazy longer term. It goes straight. It went straight up in here. I think I would leave that one alone. Okay, or at the least, wait for it to set up and let's take another look at it once it's set up. Because it did, it's a pretty impressive breakout, but it's almost straight up. Let's see what it looks like on the pullback. It does have a bit of that bottle rocket characteristic to it. O X B T. O X B T. Yeah, see, there's another one of those bottle rockets. Now, in this particular case, a dang thing went from like three to twelve. Okay, but you certainly don't want to be trading this thing now because H V one sixty six. It's just crazy, 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 okay? I guess if all you did was trade crazy stocks and you traded enough of them, you would catch, occasionally catch that big winner and go broke on a few but catch enough winners to make it worthwhile. But it's just a very dangerous way to trade, okay? Um, GSAT? GSAT. G-S-A-T. Is that going to be a satellite company? If I can get it. GSAT. I am fat fingering all over the place. Let's try it one more time. GSAT. Let's get this over here. GSAT. Nope, I can't get it to come up. Um, it seems like that sounds like a symbol I know. What's the name of the company? I'll look it up. In the meantime, let's take a look at the ESI for Mr. Peter. ESI looks good. Uh... I have a love-hate relationship with the educational stocks. They just tend to be choppy longer term, okay? If you find a setup, if you really like a setup within the educational stocks, by all means, my litmus test is if you like it, take it. The only problem with the educational stocks is it can be really, really choppy longer term. Um, a lot of bad memories in this stock, but eh, it's 20 points higher. It might be worth a shot. Let's zoom in and take a look at it. Um, I'm going to pass. Just too many bad memories in it. I hear what you're saying, though. Breakout, pullback. I'm going to give you an okay on that one, but longer term, I don't like it. GSAT, Global Star. Huh. Global Star. G-L-O-B-A-L-S-T-A-R. Well, I'm not showing it, so it must be a penny stock. Okay. GTAT. Advanced Technologies. Well, this had a nice little gap higher, a little bit of a pullback. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's not bad. It's got some bad memories back here. Uh, it's not bad. It's breaking out. The new Let's see if it, but it's also retraced quite a bit of that breakout, or at least back to this breakout level. I'd pass on it based on that, based on the bad memories. But I hear what you're saying. Um, if it finds support around 9 because it did that on a gap, it might be what I call an explosion gap pivot. It could work, but I don't know. I'm having a hard time to getting too excited about it. Yeah, GSAT's not in my database. That just, it just means that just means it's delisted or it's a penny stock or something. I can get it on another feed, but it's it's, it's not connected. It's not connected to this computer. We change out of this uh, Mountain Dew. I've got enough antifreeze in my system for now. Give me some water. Did we talk about CNX? I think we did. It's just gone sideways for about a month or two in here, so I'd leave that alone. Okay, meat. Well, it's a little sideways. Okay. And I hit my C key, and it's gone sideways for five months, four, four or five months. So, yeah, there's nothing to do there. It'd have to improve greatly. We need to do something there. CCL, Carnival Cruise Lines. Well, it's all over the place. There's no structure there. It's an electrocardiogram. Uh, you know, it, it imploded, then it re retraced 100% of what it imploded. I, and now it's up against all this overhead resistance. There's nothing to do there. PBA. You like a lot of different kind of stocks than I do, Don. Teach his own. That's what makes a market. Uh, PBA has a bit of, that bottle rock, bit of that bottle rocket look to it. Not too extreme, but it's kind of like this one wide range bar a couple of days here. And it's already pulled back. It's okay. Um, it is coming off a fairly low level, so it could be a bottom. 
Looks like you got a major all-time bottom in here. Some bad memories along the way. There's not a whole lot of clean stocks. I, you know, I feel like I'm Mikey today. I hate everything. And there's just not a whole lot of clean stocks out there. And that's not a big shocker when you pull up the NASDAQ, where we're going to get a lot of our setups from, okay, and these full letter stocks. And you see that the NASDAQ's going sideways for three weeks and now beginning to break down a little bit. So it's not a big shocker. We're not seeing a whole lot of setups. Wow, I think I just rambled on a little too long here. I'm, uh, <laughs> we're out of time. Um, the recordings get a little hard to process after about an hour and a half. Look, I have a blast doing these things, as you can tell. So I appreciate you guys coming without you. Obviously, there is no show. Uh, any unanswered questions, Dave at DaveLander.com. You know the routine. I'll try to get to you directly. And if that doesn't work, uh, we'll certainly, I'll certainly we'll cover it in next week's show. Uh, if we don't talk again, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, I'm flattered that you're here and you took time and your schedule to be here. So thank you so much.